Well, I read through that handbook for the recently deceased. It says, live people ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Rojan frying in a house somewhere in a suburb just south of Detroit because the heat is in freaking believable right now. It was like 96 or 97 today, I think, around here. Well, that's crap. It was hot. It sucked. Fortunately, mm-hmm. I was at work driving cars all day with air conditioning, so it wasn't that bad. And when you're driving in a car for like eight hours, ten hours, as soon as you get out of the car, the heat just like smacks you like a wave. Which I forgot to ask. I've got my fan blasting in the background here. Can you hear it through the audio? Is it coming through on your end? Nope. Do I sound okay? Am I good? Sure. Because it's even at two o'clock in the morning here, I think it's still like 87 degrees or something in the humidity. Are you kidding me? Where is your freaking air conditioner? I actually don't have an air conditioner in the Are office. You I've just got a fan. Me? Dude, I, <laughs> we can't afford an air conditioner for the house. <laughs> oh my god. I got freaking so, three of them. Two of them are running right now. Yeah, well, we don't live in Connecticut. We live just outside of Detroit. So, uh, blah blah. I keep blah. saying peace out from the D and stuff. I don't actually live in Detroit. I live just south of Detroit. <laughs> I don't, well, you know what? Peace out from the D sounds a hell of a lot better than peace out from somewhere close to the D. That's awesome. So, what's been up with you, man? How's it how's it been? It's going, dude. It's going. I'm not, you know, I can't really complain. Still trying to do the crunch to get the house on the market. Got to put new brakes all the way around in the van. You know, the yeah. normal nonsense. Living the American dream. Dude, I'm living it hard. Then, um, you're going to uh, Indiana in, what, two weeks? Is that two not weeks even, away? That's about 10 days now. Wow. Maybe a little more than 10 days. With like the 12. schedule of interviews that we have coming up, you might Ugh. you might be able to actually just take that week off. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I'm going to be able to stay away from this. I'll be on the wife's phone. Well, let me uh, lead off with here. We've been talking a lot about Tesla. It's it's no secret at this point that we're, we're huge Nikolai Tesla fanboys mm-hmm. and whatnot. And we've been talking about putting this Thomas Edison, Nikolai Tesla interview together. Well, we have this place in Michigan called the Henry Ford Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford Historical Museum. And basically, what it's, it is a historical museum. You can go there, and they've got all of the cars there. They've got all, the, this, all this historical stuff. It's really, really cool. So I was there, and I've been trying to get pictures set up so when we do this episode, whenever the heck it's going to happen, I'll have all kinds of neat little pictures and stuff. So the other day, me and the wife go there. I'm like, hey, you know, we've got a membership there because I'm a big, I'm a big historical buff with stuff like that. And I could go in the museum. They've got the the dynamos and the generators and the original steam machines in there. And I could just hang out in that section forever because I'm a steampunk fanatic. And you go nice. in there and you see all these big steam engines, and some of them actually work. They've keep them, they keep them in pristine, beautiful condition. So I was in there and. You know, it's it's Thomas Edison everywhere. Thomas Edison this, Thomas Edison that, blah, 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 blah. And then they've got this one little tiny section for Nikolai Tesla with a little brass bust head of him and a little blurb about him. And that's kind of the Tesla section. And then we've got all the Thomas Edison stuff over here. So I'm like, Ooh. all right, whatever. So we go, through the, we go through the village, and they actually have Thomas Edison's original laboratory there and the original boarding house that all these people stayed at. So me and the wife were talking, and she gave me this idea. I said, well, we're ha- having too hard of a time finding you know, information to possibly get people on the show to talk about Tesla, um, but I can't really find a whole lot of people that have books out there about Edison. I know they're out there, but I just haven't seen a whole lot of them. Mm-hmm. So she will, why don't we go to, the, go to the museum, and we'll talk to the people that are inside these buildings and stuff you know, for when people come through and see if you can talk to somebody there, and maybe you'll find somebody that will talk about Edison for the show. I'm like, all right, that'll work. 
So we go into Thomas Edison's laboratory. And it's his original laboratory. This isn't the laboratory that happened years later on when he started buying people's patents. This is the laboratory when he actually was creating his own inventions before he started buying other people's patents out and saying, hey, this invention is now mine. Mm, uh, buying. I like the way you used the term buying. That's basically what he did. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that what he did was necessarily evil. He was a businessman, and that's business. I don't – and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, and I'm, I'm not – He it, it does detract from the cool factor, whereas Tesla – you know, we've, we've had this discussion, though. Mm -hmm. So anyhow – I go into the laboratory, and there's two floors to the laboratory, which I'm going to post pictures for eventually here. And on the bottom floor, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of old-fashioned generators, a little woodworking shop and everything. And there's this woman there talking to these other people that are in there, and she's talking about the differences between AC and DC and how we started with DC, and then we switched over to AC, and now slowly but surely, apparently, we're switching back to DC. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm hearing her talk. Edison is the electrical messiah, yada, yada, yada. Ugh. All right. All right, whatever. I'm not going to be rude, and you know. But I didn't go. Them. I know you. You. I, I would have been have, swinging hammers. I would have had to have put like 100 mile an hour duct tape wrapped around your face. <laughs> you know, took in any kind of writing implements out of your hand, um, mm. and sat on you with my rather large Rubenesque size to keep you from getting off the floor and saying Rubenesque. So anyhow, I go upstairs. My wife is like, my wife, like she sees the look on my face and she's like, I don't want to be here and get embarrassed by my husband. So she kind of like scampers off upstairs to the upper level. So I'm like, all right, I'll get out of here and come back and talk to this lady a little bit. So we go upstairs and there's another woman upstairs and the upstairs laboratory has all these cool bottles. And it's, it's just, it's cool to see. I mean, even if I could, if you ever come to Detroit, I need to take you to this place, but you just, it's just cool to go in and see all this really cool stuff. Again, it's like, this is steampunk. This is real steampunk here. Right. So I go upstairs and there's this old woman up there and I start taking pictures and stuff and she's quoting all this stuff off. And, you know, I know about a lot of this stuff. So I was, I wasn't going to be rude. And then I brought up, uh, we start talking and she can't, I can't remember exactly what she said. And then I brought up Tesla and almost immediately you could see the expression on her face change to, Oh, you're one of those people. Oh, Jesus. Um, okay. Well, you know, and you could see that she was like really uncomfortable about talking and it was really bizarre because, you know, I, I was just, I was drank the Kool-Aid man. I, you're, it, that's you're... almost what it was. <laughs> And I wasn't like I wasn't being confrontational with her. I was being very, very polite, very, very friendly. She just did not want to budge. And she's like, "Well, there's Thomas Edison's chair, and we nailed it to the floor, so no one would ever sit in it again." And this is that over here. And I'm like, "All right, I could tell. I'm not going to get anywhere with this." And mm -hmm. you know, I was trying to say, "Hey, is there anybody here we could talk to about possibly getting it onto the show?" And she's like, "Is it a television show?" I'm like, "No, it's a podcast." And she was like podcast i'm too old does not compute i'm like um it's it's an internet radio show um you know we we, we it's like the the talkies the black and white movies and they've moved oh, on to the talkies oh, now. you didn't say that no i did not say that no no <laughs> so the wife now is slowly creeping down the stairs because she's like here goes the husband weird not again so we go back downstairs and she's like you're ready to go no i'm like no i want to go back down here and talk to this person because there's nobody in there now and i want to get some pictures in front of these little generators and stuff these original old school generators and batteries and things like that so we go down and i start talking to the woman in the other room and i bring up the tesla thing again nonchalantly and she kind of had the oh you're one of those people attitude to her but she wasn't as bad and i could tell that she was trying to be polite so i rolled with that and i was like yes nikolai tesla doing a doing a, an internet radio show and she was actually pretty cool about it and we had a very civil conversation but it felt very much like hi i'm a democrat hi i'm a republican you know that was that oh, was worse than that man it's that, worse than that it's like walking <laughs> in and going hi i'm a christian oh well i'm an atheist <laughs> it was it was very similar it had it had that feel to it but we did have a very cool civil conversation but what blew me away it was just like I wasn't I wasn't walking in there oh this is all sham tesla did this and this is all a lie i was i just brought up the name and I think what it was is I think there's been people in there that have probably said that to these people. You could you could tell that you could tell that they were they were shaken by it and they didn't want to go into a huge discussion. And the woman downstairs, she was much cooler, and I didn't approach her, you know, guns ablaze, and I just brought it up casually. And she, it was kind of like two cats circling each other, feeling each other out. You know, I don't know how to describe it. 
But it was all well. She gave me a name of somebody I'm going to contact. And we had a very civil conversation about Nikolai Tesla and Thomas Edison. It feels weird saying it that way. We had a civil conversation about two wonderful men of electricity, electrical wizards of the world. You know, but that's... My name's Harry Potter. (laughs) I promise this is going to be the last time we talk about Tesla for a little while. Because as synchronicity would have it, I got home and I was digging through the pictures. And through one of the news feeds, I turned on a computer and instantly this story pops up. Serbia wants UN to honor Tesla birthday. And I said, man, we just talked about Tesla with the car last week. We talk about Tesla every week. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure people are going to be tired of us talking about Tesla. We are not the Tesla cast, but bear with us, people. This is the last time I'm going to talk about Tesla until we actually do the show, whenever that will be. But this is uh, this is coming from energydaily.com. Of course, I will post the links to everything we talk about up on the website. Serbia wants the UN to honor Tesla birthday. Serbia says it will ask the United Nations to declare the date, birth date of scientist and inventor Nikolai Tesla the International Science Day. In 2010, Serbia declared Tesla's birthday, July 10th, as Science Day in Serbia, with events drawing attention to Tesla's accomplishments. The news agency Tan Jung reported, Tesla was born in a region of Austria-Hungary that is today Croatia and has built his career in the United States. Best remembered for his many revolutionary developments in the field of electromagnetism in the late 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries, Tesla was an important figure in early history of commercial electricity, whose patents and theoretical work formed the basis for modern alternating current and electrical power systems. The events of Science Day in Serbia are intended to bring science closer to to the people and show young generations interest in science can be beneficial, the Center of Promotional Science said in a statement. An exhibition dubbed De-Revolutionibus traces the history of science back to 1500, the year of the beginning of the scientific revolution, the Serbian news agency Tanjung reported. I think we should just move on because nobody's going to hear the effort that I just went through to try to tell that story. Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> All right, that's one in the can. A lot of stuff in Asia. Oh, dude, everything comes from Asia. Even our, I mean, the clothes I'm wearing, for God's sakes. Uh, This is uh, asiaparanormal.blogspot.com. It's the bizarre case of the Kira UFO encounters. In a case that might have served as one of the inspirations for the Steven Spielberg, J.J. Abrams blockbuster Super 8, a group of Japanese kids had repeated run-ins with a small silver UFO, which they managed to not only photograph but actually capture for a brief time during the summer of 1972. There is an inexplicably little information to be found in the Western world anyway regarding the strange series of events that began on August 25, 1972 in the Kara area of Kachi City, which is the capital of Kachi Prefecture in the Shikoku Island of Japan. On the afternoon in question, a 13-year-old student named Michio Sio was on his way home from middle school when he allegedly caught sight of an unbelievable metallic object hovering over a rice field. The awestruck CO watched the odd apparatus zip back and forth above the waterlogged paddy. The airborne object resembled a dull silver hat with a flat bottom and narrow lip. The curved dome atop the lip was relatively steep and level at the apex. CO would later compare the object's movements to that of a bat making hairpin turns in pursuit of its insect prey. That's the whole article. That's that's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, dude, well, the thing is, it's, it's from 1972, and like most stuff that happens overseas, we hear very little about it. This is one of those times where I get something envisioned into my head, and I mm-hmm. it says here that they actually managed to capture it and that there's photographs floating around. I wonder what those photographs look like, and the more I think about it, it's probably just going to be a little ball of light in the air. Might be. Um, I'm interested in how they caught it. I mean, here here my brain goes again. I I envision kids running through a field with butterfly nets catching UFOs. Sure. And you know, and they bring it home, "Mom, can I keep it?" And the mom, mom would can be, "Can I keep it?" Yeah. It's only a little bigger than a firefly, mom. 
you're going to be responsible for feeding the UFO. See, the the bad thing is, I have friends that are that that spent time in Japan, and I've heard all the weird things that they eat. And the first thing that came to my mind was this dude was looking at it like a dinner bell. Yeah, and an important public public safety reminder: always make sure to get your pet UFO neutered or spayed. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Barker. <laughs> it doesn't really have much more on here. The no. little thing that says "click here" to read the full article, and I click it, yet nothing happens. So no, I didn't see anything either. That's that's the extent of it. Short and sweet. And what we're going to talk about next, we're going to go over to a small subregion of Uzbekistan. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I'm going to have you read this article because by this point, everybody who listens to the show knows that I have a hard time grasping the English language, let alone trying to speak a foreign language. <laughs> oh, my God. But this is a really cool story, though. I was going to cover this when I was doing the anomalous pieces, and there's some really cool photos on here. Once we get done talking about this piece, I'm going to put the link, and I'm actually going to put some of the raw photos from this up on the website for the story because – it, the pictures are really beautiful, but it's also a They're man-made. Haunting. It's very haunting. It's it's very cool, but it is very haunting. It's typical of a, of a man-made, you know, Russian Soviet disaster. I'll let you go ahead and jump right on into it, and then we'll just talk about it. All right. Well, it comes from artificialowl.net, and it's uh, the Aral Sea shipwrecks of Minek. Uh, Minek is a city in northern Karakal, Pakistan, in northern Uzbekistan, home of only a few thousand residents at most. Minex population has been declining precipitously since the 1980s due to the recession of the Aral Sea. Once a bustling fishing community, Minex is now a shadow of its former self, dozens of miles from the rapidly receding shoreline of the Aral Sea. Fishing had always been part of the economy of the region, and Minex became a center of industrial fishing and canning, a regional agricultural monoculture dominated by cotton production, which diverts water from tributary rivers of the sea into irrigation, and severe pollution caused by agricultural chemical runoff are, are causing the sea to evaporate in water that remains in highly saline and very toxic, causing the ecological disaster, which is inevitably destroying the sea and killing the residents of the town in its vicinity, including Minak. Minak is now home to an incongruous armada of rusting hulks that once made up a proud fishing fleet during the Soviet era. Poisonous dust storms kick up the strong winds across the dried and polluted seabed, give rise to a multitude of chronic and acute illnesses among a few residents. Weather unmoderated by the sea now buffets the town with hotter than normal summers and colder than normal winters. The Aral Sea was once the world's fourth largest saline body of water. It has been steadily shrinking since the 1960s, after the river, river that fed it were diverted by Soviet Union irrigation projects. By 2004, the sea had shrunk to 25% of its original surface area. A nearly five-fold increase in salinity had killed most of the natural flora and fauna. By 2007, it had declined to 10% of its original size, splitting into three separate lakes, two of which are too salty to support fish. The once prosperous fishing industry has been virtually destroyed, and former fishing towns along the original shores have become ship graveyards. With this collapse has come unemployment and economical hardship. The disappearance of the lake was no surprise to the Soviets. They expected it to happen long before. As early as 1964, Alexandra Aserin at the Hydro Project Institute pointed out that the lake was doomed, explaining... It was part of a five-year plan approved by the Council of Ministers of the Palataboro. Nobody on a lower level would dare to say a word contradicting these, those plans, even if it was the fate of the Aral Sea. Yeah, it's it's a massive, massive sea. It's 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 easily probably as big as one of the Great Lakes, or at least a couple of the Great Lakes. Oh, absolutely. And it was absolutely huge. And they pretty much just destroyed it because they diverted water from the lake. And when they did that, the pl- lake just dried up. Mm-hmm. And when you see these pictures, what it reminds me of is that movie Tank Girl, where right. you see deserts of just, you know, big, long deserts with just ships sitting there. And that's all that these pictures are. They're just big, long deserts with camels grazing, camels grazing in them, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, just ships. And it's real desolate, real vacated, and just rusted out hulking ships sitting in the middle of giant fields. See, but, you know, uh, I, I wish that people would... I mean, really, if you if you get a chance, really look at these pictures, and what comes to mind is right now for me is what's going on in China with the Mekong River. They're diverting water, they're putting in dams, and you know it, those dams are causing earthquakes now because of the pressure. Oh yeah, that's people right. Just, they just people just don't care that they, they don't care about what they're doing because it stands in the way of industry. 
whether it's uh, agricultural or, or um, you know, hard fact industry, they just don't care. And this should be like a hallmark of what not to do. I'm going to try to find some of the before pictures of what happened, too, because I've seen the before pictures of what this looked like. And it, if you look at it now, it looks like nuclear wasteland. It literally oh, yeah, does. Terrible. And if you see what it looked like before, it looks like, you know, it's it's trees and lakes and grass. And, you know, it looks like a normal what you would like see somewhere when you I'd go, want to hang out. Yeah. Like when you go up north to a cabin up north or somewhere out in the countryside, we you got your cabin at and you want to go hunting, you want to go fishing. That's what it looked like. Now it looks like nuclear wasteland. It's very beautiful, but very haunting at the same time. www.whatsonziamond.com It's a rare donkey zebra mix born in Ziamond, Haichang Safari Park. It's a rare hybrid cross of a donkey father and a zebra mother is attracting attention at the Ziamond Haichang Safari Park after he was born on Sunday, reports Ziamond Daily. The Z-Donk has black and white stripes prominently displayed on his four legs, but its brown body hair looks more like a donkey. He is said to be in good health and has bonded with his zebra mother, who raises her powerful hind legs to attack any animal or a zookeeper trying to reach the baby animal. That's a good sign. The Ziamond Haichang Safari Park keeps its only zebra and three male donkeys in the same enclosure. Zookeepers didn't know about the mate until the zebra got pregnant last July, leaving it hard to identify the real father among the three donkeys. Does it really matter? <laughs> I'm kidding. It's like a four- child, charge I, child support. I, I know, right? Mm. Who's the da- who's baby mama? <laughs> it's the fourth reported case around the world. And Professor Wang Yuquan from Ziamin University said donkeys and zebras are different species having the same chromosomes, which makes the hybrid offspring biologically work. But the romance would not likely happen if the two animals were not kept in a closed breeding environment together. You know That's what? That's the whole story. What a train wreck. I think we shouldn't read any more Asian stories because no, they're direct we're, translations we're, almost of English. We're bo- English. We're butchering this. Dude, I don't know. Zebra got pregnant the last July. I know. I know. I read that right. Okay. I don't know. Uh, it, whatever it is, it's not right on the teleprompter. I don't know what that is. I've never seen that. Okay. The, now I can't read it. There's no. There's no words on it. Sure. There's yeah. no words there. I can't do it. If you look at the picture, it looks bizarre. It's got. Well, the you thing know, the top me half of the body is brown, but the legs are zebra legs. It's cute. Well, it is. It's adorable, but it reminds me of a quagga, but they've been extinct for quite a while now. What is a quagga? It's, it looks like this animal right here. It's a, it was, it had, well, it was, it more had the rear end of a, um, a zebra and the front end looked like a donkey for all intents and purposes. And they went extinct. There's been some, um, uprising in the community the scientific community to try and bring the animal back. I mean, we have the technology and look at this little critter. <laughs> you know what this reminds me of when I look at it? It reminds me of that creature that they found in Africa. I believe it was South Africa. Mm, the Alcapi were giant guinea pigs. I think this, No, those are capybara capybara. You're right. So the, yeah, you're Alcapi. That's what you're, that's right. And mm-hmm. they were kind of like a horse, but they weren't a horse. They had toes. They had zebra features. Yeah, and they, looking, they look like a tiny little giraffe that mated with a zebra and a, something else yeah that they that's what this reminds me of because yeah. when when you guys see the picture if you come to their website and check this thing out it's actually pretty cute it definitely it, it looks like a donkey with zebra legs it's it's pretty neat but uh yeah come to the site and check it out and try to reread the story with proper in- english skills <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> This week's For the Lulz caption of the show, we're going to 
have a piece on here from bignewsnetwork.com. I don't want to pronounce the entire website because I don't want to read a paragraph of numbers, slashes, question marks, <laughs> equal signs, HTTPs, dots, whatnots, things, and curly cues. Um, so suffice to say, we'll have the link up on the site. Oh, but I like the curly cues. <laughs> Here we go with the weird voices again. Oh, boy. Um, this one is UK mom develops furniture polish cravings. A pregnant lady in the UK suffers from a bizarre eating disorder. She feels compelled to eat furniture polish at least three times a day. Seven months pregnant, Emma has already gone through three cans. Despite her fears, she may be harming her unborn child, baby girl, reports the son. I read that wrong, but I'm going to continue anyways. Push on. Emma has been diagnosed with PICO, a rare disorder which sees sufferers crave non-food items. I can't explain why I like it so much. I think it has a lot to do with the texture. I normally spray a bit on my fingers and lick it off or spray it onto a duster and suck. Yes, I Ugh. read that properly. Ugh. Emma from Birmingham first became obsessed with sniffing furniture polish, polish when pregnant with her first child, daughter Darcy, now 11 months. She and boyfriend Gavin Willis, 27, are reportedly desperate to give up her habit. Uh, where do you even go with that? How do you... <sighs> What makes you wake up in the morning? I know when my wife was pregnant, she really craved Taco Bell. But what makes you wake up in the morning and look over at a bottle of lemony scented pledge and go, damn, that looks tasty. You know, what, what I got makes you, nothing. What, I, got, I, I have no idea. I mean, you're pregnant, dude. You know, I've eaten some stuff that would gag a maggot on a gut truck, but I kind of draw the line at polish. Does does the baby inside, you know, is that is it jerking on the umbilical cord saying, hey, mom, give me some pledge? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> pledge please none of that old english thank you <laughs> well this is an english story <laughs> well you know still the visual i get in my head she sprays it on a duster then she just puts it in her mouth and sucks on a duster see this this is the thing i the visual i get is you know little happy housewife emma wandering around and she's polishing this and polishing that and then all of a sudden she just like runs her finger through the polish and sticks it in her mouth and goes oh mm. god and there's like this light bulb in her head. Boom! I can buy this stuff at the Quickie Mart. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, pretty nasty. I mean, I drank, I drank uh, shoe polish before, but that's for a different story. I drank charcoal later fluid when I was a little kid, but my yeah, no, I was an adult when I did this. I drank a glass of unleaded gasoline because I thought it was bourbon. So I figure as a good segue into that last little bit of my tawdry past. We'll move on to something a little more uh, interesting. Well played, the... sir. Very well played. <laughs> this is uh, off the Huffington Post dot com, and this is Louis D. Hostetler, Amish teen, arrested for allegedly drinking beer in horse and buggy and leading police on a chase. I can honestly say I've never been in a horse nor a buggy, nor was I ever driving drunk. I was usually too fall down to do that. <laughs> there are hot pursuits and there are trot pursuits, but um bumps. After a short attempt at a hoof-powered getaway, an Amish teen who was allegedly spotted drinking beer in a horse and buggy was locked up by sheriff's deputies in Cattaraugus County, New York. Deputies say that Louis D. Hostetler, 17, holding an open can of beer inside his buggy on Route 62 at around <laughs> 1 a.m. on July 18th, the Buffalo News reports. When the driver of the buggy refused to stop, police chased the carriage and apprehended the suspect, according to the paper. Now, here's the here's the, the great part, okay? The, the dude's 17, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here we go. Hostetler was report, has reportedly been hit with a number of charges, including resisting arrest, unlawful possession of alcohol, obstructing governmental administration, <laughs> failure to yield <laughs> to an emergency vehicle, littering, <laughs> and operating a vehicle without taillights. <laughs> I... I'm a recovering drug addict, you know, and I've never even gotten a parking ticket thus far. This dude is in a horse and buggy and has a laundry list of infractions. <laughs> what a dumbass. Been spending most our lives living oh. in an Amish paradise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. This isn't the first time the Amish teen in Amish teen in Cataragus County has galloped towards trouble with the law after allegedly drinking and driving an animal. <laughs> Last year, 17-year-old Levi Detwiller was arrested after per 
purportedly leading police on a one-mile chase until he took a turn too quickly and rolled over his buggy. I mean, come on. Oh, I want to go party in this town. I'm, for real? We're Holy hanging out cow. in the wrong places, man. Apparently with the wrong religious sect as well. <laughs> Amish know how to throw down, man. Apparently. Like a champ. Oh, God. <laughs> nice. Uh, moving on. <laughs> oh. All right. So um, I've got a piece here. Um, somebody posted this up on Facebook. I don't know if they posted it on our page or not. I don't quite remember, but I came across it. And I guess this would be more paranormal or science oriented than the drunk Amish story. Um, <laughs> Though that was yes. funny. This is a story with a twist. Well, we do talk about spirituality, so I guess drunk Amish would constitute as spirituality. That's a stretch. I'm trying here, man. Oh, oh. Like <laughs> so this, silly putty. Yeah. So this story is woman 22 grows full-size nipple on the sole of her foot. And this comes from the Mail Online, uh, which is .co.uk. Of course, I'll put a link up. I'm not going to read all of the numbers and stuff off again. But this is a a 22-year-old Brazilian woman has grown a full-sized extra nipple on the sole of her foot. Although 1 in 50 women and 1 in 100 men have extra nipples, according to the California-based Dermatology Journal, it's the first time one has ever been discovered so far down somebody's body. The woman told doctors she had the unusual growth, which is almost 2 inches wide all her life, and it had never caused her any pain. Although most of the time, extra nipples are found along the milk lines, which run from the genitals into the armpits, they have been discovered on the, on the back, thigh, or even face. Can you imagine having a third nipple on your face? Well, you know what? I think I knew somebody that did have a third nipple on their face now that I think about it. I just didn't realize it was a nipple till now. Did you call him a boob? No, I would have at the time, though. <laughs> <laughs> but never the feet... But never the feet. According no. to researchers in Brazil, a 22-year-old woman sought medical care for a lesion in the plantar region of her left foot, a well-formed nipple surrounded by areola and hair. Third nipples have been mentioned throughout history and folklore, and once were known as witch's nipples. Anne Boyle and one of Henry V's wives was rumored to have not only a third nipple, but also a third breast, causing some to brand her a witch. And if you go to the site, you know what? If there's ever a time to go, there's of all the stories we've covered this episode, there's a lot of good reasons to go to projectarchivist.com and check out the pictures. The pictures of the boats in the sea are great. And then right in the middle of the page, when you go to it, is the bottom of this woman's foot with the giant nipple in the bottom of it. So if you have a foot fetish, you're probably going <laughs> to oh, spend no. some time on the site. Yeah, it's pretty weird. <laughs> it's pretty bizarre. And then, of course, the comment section at the bottom are always fantastic. Uh, let's see here. She's going to need a sports bra if she gets athlete's foot. <laughs> and then there's another one. If she gets pregnant, she'll be one step ahead of the other woman. Oh. <laughs> wow. These are cornball jokes. And then there's one that says it'd be it'd be handy if she, had, she gave birth to triplets. Oh, God. Thanks. We'll be here all week. Try the prime rib. It's great. Tip your waitresses. They're working hard for you. And we'll just toss that off. Garbage. Very good. Very good. What makes you think she's a witch? Well, she turned me into a newt. A newt. We got better. All right, this is a piece we wanted to cover a couple of shows ago for a little while, but we just never got around to it. And this is about vision quests. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and pre-recorded it to save us some time and save us some editing. I'm going to play it right now, and then we'll just discuss the piece afterwards. Cool. Throughout indigenous North America, the vision quest is among the most sacred rituals. Although used primarily by healers and practitioners of native religions, it is not entirely reserved for those individuals. Coming in the form of dreams, visions have affected the course of the Indian social and political development throughout history. Among the Lakota Sioux, dreams and their inherent meaning are explained by a particular spirit practitioner. The Lakota have a specific term for dreams and meaning behind those dreams, an himbla. This is a general term for the study and interpretation of the images presented to an individual during a vision quest. As visions are seen as a means through which the supernatural world may contact and advise the natural world, the interpretation of dreams and visions remains an important part of Lakota society. Called Hamble Chape, the vision quest stands out as one of the primary rites of passage among the members of the Lakota community. 
The purpose of a vision quest is for the participant to receive guidance from the spiritual world. Depending on the dream and images presented within the dream, the participant is guided to make important life choices. In many cases, a person experiencing a vision will receive guidance from their particular animal spirit. However, relatives and friends, as well as cultural figures from Lakota mythology, may also appear. As with all other aspects of indigenous rituals, the vision quest is highly formalized. The participant must first perform the Hambalseya, a fasting ritual that is shrouded in mystery. According to Lakota mythology, the Hambalseya was introduced by the spirit Hope, also known as the Falling Star, the daughter of a spirit called Sky. Appearing before the village council, she instructed the tribe on the proper rituals to learn in order that they may serve a higher purpose. As a vision quest is a means through which one can gain enlightenment, the fasting ritual has become an essential aspect of the journey. After having completed the Hambalseya, the participant in the vision quest must then embark on a journey into the wilderness. Taking only a personal medicine bag, the individual must find a quiet place in the midst of the surrounding nature. As there is no specific place outlined in the ritual itself, the location of this particular place is up to the participant. In most cases, the selected site is a personal or spiritual significance to the participant. Once the participant has selected the location, he or she must then begin the meditation. Sitting in quiet reflection for up to four days, the participant must look deep into his or her soul. This self-reflection amidst the peace and solitude provided by the wilderness can also have an adverse effect on the participant's psyche. In some cases, slight bouts of madness have accompanied a vision quest. It is at this stage that the actual vision occurs. After having fasted and remained alone in quiet reflection, the participant in the vision quest sees a series of images that at first can be confusing. In order to fully understand the dreams and what they pretend, the participant must return to his or her village and seek the counsel of an honored elder who truly understands dreams. It is the individual's reaction to the dreams and what they may pretend that determines his or her future success. The vision quest remains among the most enduring symbols of Lakota spirituality. It is not uncommon for modern-day Lakota to embark on a vision quest in order to gain a clear perspective on important life choices. So that is the piece that I recorded on Native American vision quests. I liked it. I thought it was good. The thing is about vision quests, from what I've come to discover, is that everybody thinks that this is purely uh, a Native American thing, and that's not necessarily true. Every culture and every religion, religion has their form of a vision quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christianity has the tale of Jonah. The Muslims have the dervishes. Uh, the Buddhists have something called uh, Siddhartha. Siddhartha. That's, that's their form of going on a vision quest. And if you look throughout pretty much any religion, they all have some form of some kind of a vision quest or spiritual purification along those lines. Um, and everybody just thinks that it's purely a Native American thing. Now, the Native Americans appear to have refined it, and it does have a bit more mystique to it and romanticism, for lack of a better term. But um, it's not that unusual uh, of a thing. You know, every every culture, I believe in even in uh, Catholicism with the Catholics, they have some kind of a ritual where it involves hitting yourself in the back with a whip of some kind. Self-flagellation. Yes, exactly. And that's that's a very similar. It, it all comes down to sensory deprivation and, and things like that. And they all tend to have the same outcome and the same effect. And they're all used in the same way, shape or form to come to a similar answer or, or a similar state of being, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand you have a little bit of knowledge about this as well. I have a bit. I have a bit. I, uh, I went on one of my own um, vision quests many, many, many moons ago uh, to the same um, outcome, I would venture to say, more or less. I mean, it, uh, I was forced into mine as a, as a rectifying measure for some... Um, let's just say reprehensible behavior. <laughs> no, and not you. <laughs> no, not at all. But, uh, it was, it was very, um, eye opening. It was, I have, ugh, I might as well say it. I mean, enough people know me well enough. Um, I have a spirit guide. I've had a spirit guide since I was a little kid, little, little kid. And, um, it was, I want to say that the experience that I went through amplified my interaction with said individual. Mm-hmm. So um, it was it was a, it was an eye opening experience. I tend to wonder if more people were to do this kind of thing, not necessarily the self flagellation or whatever, but to go on some form of thing like this that 
if it would eliminate the need for a lot of people to go and see a psychologist or something oh, yeah. like that. Dude, totally. You know, if, if more people could just, you know, okay, there's something wrong with me. I don't know if I need drugs. I need whatever. It's like, dude, go go camping for a weekend. Go out in the woods or go on a, a, a you know, a journey of self-discovery and look within yourself mm-hmm. and see what you can pull out of yourself. It's just that the way that these, these cultures go about this with the, um, the starving yourself and things like that, it tends to trigger more in the subconscious. But I tend to wonder, you know, how many people, there's a lot of people that I know, you know, I just want to look at and be like, all right, well, if you can't afford a shrink, if you don't need a psychologist, you know, maybe you don't. Maybe you just need to go out and find yourself and, and find something inside you that you're looking for. Yeah, head so, out to the woods. Or Bring something. a granola bar and a prayer. <laughs> and an That's Indian it. medicine bag. <laughs> That's it. I got a bunch of those. Grigri bags. What it, what is an Indian medicine bag? What it, I'm well, sorry, a Native American medicine bag. What what is one of those? What it, it depends on who you're talking to. It depends on what branch you're talking to. It depends on what tribe you're talking to. Um, the 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 bags I carry around are gri gri bags. Um, they're they're um, minerals and stones that have quote unquote. Um, I don't want to say healing powers because that just sounds hokey. But I mean, if if you're dealing with, see, ugh, I'm a I'm an analytical mind. I'm a scientific mind. I I want to say that none of this stuff works, but unfortunately, I have been privy to stuff that actually does work. So for me to sit here and say that it doesn't work would be completely ludicrous, and it would make me a hypocrite. Well, not necessarily because I'm in the same boat. I've seen things and had things happen to me that I can't necessarily explain. But mm. me and you are both in the grounds of I think you know if somebody had to view us to say something, we would we would probably be viewed as skeptics. Mm-hmm. Yet we've both had experiences of one kind or another that don't necessarily fall into the mainstream. So yep. you know by by nature of being for what's happened to us, you know we that's why we're here. <laughs> right. Well, so, I'll tell you one of. I think one I'm of talking my, in uh, circles right now. <laughs> <laughs> one of my one of the Grigri bags that I used to carry around with me, and I, I still have it. It's sitting downstairs on one of my altars, but um, it uh, it has a small blade, a piece of petrified wood, hematite, malachite. Um, there's a crystal in it. There's some salt. It's just it's stuff that works. You know, it, it, even if it's just a sense of well-being by carrying it. Yes. Like when I when I have chapped lips, I'll carry it. I'll I'll have really bad chapped lips, so I'll go out and I'll get you know Carmex, and I'll put it in my pocket. The minute I put it in my pocket, my chapped lips go away. So I'm mm-hmm. like, why the hell did I waste my money on buying this crap? So <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I can't explain it. So we're at the end of the show. It, God, it it feels like doing this one was a battle. It really does. <laughs> it's a battle of attrition, really. <laughs> it was this putting this show together just seemed like it was a battle because we've actually recorded it over a three day process this time. Much hilarity ensued. <laughs> oh, God, dude, I haven't laughed that hard in a while. Yeah, so this is uh this is where uh, this will end for now. You've got something you wanted to cover real quick, so let's get that out of the way. Yeah, we have, uh, we have some of our listeners that are that are. Uh, part of my literal extended family and uh some of them that are you know just close friends and we uh a year ago today and then a couple of days before and after we recorded uh two of our close friends passed away and i just wanted to give a shout out to my loved ones and uh remind them of how important life really is that's it okay nothing too sappy well i'm gonna segue from that and deal with something from our family which is the podcasting family that we're all a part of and I'm going to send, uh, well, we're both going to send a congratulations out to TJ over at the 13, Sp- uh, 13 Skulls podcast. Mm-hmm. He announced on episode 60, which was a great episode to announce it on, that he has a little TJ on the works and on the way. So uh, I guess we're sending out a congratulations to him. Absolutely. It's funny. I posted a video I found on YouTube of this little, there's this little baby walking around this house that's rocking out to Pandera. It's headbanging. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Fist throwing stuff. It's hysterical. And I posted that over on his page. It said, here comes little TJ or something to that effect. It's awesome. 
But now I'm we so need to, to uh, yeah, yeah. So am I. Well, we me and you have known about it for a while, and we just mm-hmm. we had to keep our mouth shuts about it. So oh, we're like, God, yeah. we're biting our lip and stuff. Oh. So, you know. Um, and then we have something else that we need to get out of the way, and we've been teasing you guys for a little while about uh, for a little while now about who our next interview is going to be. You want to go ahead and throw it out there? It is the one, the only, the infamous Linda Godfrey. Linda Godfrey. Oh. We have been wanting to talk to Linda Godfrey before we even got this podcast together. I was wanting to talk to her when I was doing the 13 Skulls for TJ. I wanted to make her one of our interviews. Mm -hmm. And she directly is a result of how this show came together because me and you sat down and we started talking about if we ever got to interview Linda Godfrey, what would we ask her? And then the ideas just started flowing and they just started flowing. And that was what formed the core to actually get this show started. Mm -hmm. So she's going to be on the show. We're going to be recording the show this weekend. If you want to ask some questions of her, that would be great. Go ahead and email us some questions at projectarchivist at gmail.com. If you want to go on the Facebook page and throw some questions up there, uh, we'll write them down or we'll bounce into them when we're up there. Just try to refrain from asking the usual stereotypical questions that she's been asked nine million times like, do you think aspirin works? Do you think <laughs> werewolves are real? How did you get into studying werewolves? Um, you know, try to we're we're going to try to come up as best as we can. We've got a slew of different kinds of questions we're going to mm-hmm. ask. So throw some questions up there. If you want to know something and this is your chance, this is your chance to ask her. Um, again, please try not to ask her stuff, though, if you can, that that hasn't been covered in other shows and other podcasts. But, yeah, we're really stoked to have her on. She's a really classy lady, and I can't wait to talk to her. Uh, no, neither can I. I can't wait to pick her is, brain. Yeah, either, either can I. The only downside is we've only got her for an hour, and I'm sure we could keep her occupied for about three hours. And then, oh, yeah. Then the Skype call would mysteriously end. So. <laughs> oh. Her end or something, I'm sure. Like, I can't talk to you freakazoids anymore. <laughs> we're done now. Goodbye. <laughs> nice. Nah, I don't think that would happen. I also need to send, uh, send a shout-out to uh, Johnny Cat on Facebook. He's put together a project called Screamer, which is his tribute to a band called Sunscream. And he's given us our closing music this week. And this is the song. We're going to close out the show with the song Pressure. Um, him and his spouse have put these. Um, they're, they're great cover versions. I actually like the cover versions he does better than the original songs. They're a little bit darker. He takes the songs from a different point of view. And mm-hmm. quite frankly, if somebody's out there making electronic music and they want to give it to us for the show, we're probably going to take it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. But we know these guys. Um, they're great friends of the show. And I'm really happy to be closing the show out with this. Right. Um, next, I'm going to move on to the tremendous amount of downloads we have gotten this. Oh, dude, sickness is ensuing. I don't know who or what is promoting our show out there. This week, particularly, our, our site hits and our downloads spiked really hard Mm -hmm. i don't know why i really appreciate it either you guys are going out there and telling people about the show thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you or somebody somewhere out there is blogging about us or talking about us and that means that you guys have come to check the show out hopefully you're still here come and check us out on stitcher if you're not already listening to us on stitcher we've got a bunch of fans out there that are listening to us on stitcher you know that's pretty much it you know and you've got your thing that you want to run through yeah well if you want to you want to leave us a uh Review on iTunes. Please go to iTunes and leave us a review. And, you know, neither myself nor Rogan are not against uh, critical thinking as long as it's uh, constructive criticism. <laughs> Please don't tell me I look like an ape because it's probably true. Um, <laughs> also, you know, we're on Facebook all the time. You know, drop us a line on Facebook. Drop us a line at uh, our um, email, which is projectarchivist at gmail.com. Give us a phone call. You want to shoot out that phone number? Sure. 734-681-0459. If you have some kind of a paranormal story you want to send us, if you have something happen to you, you know somebody it's ha- something has happened to, go on and shoot it over to us. We won't mention your name if you don't want us to. We're completely cool with that. We'll change your name if you want to because we understand that sending these stories in can be a little weird sometimes. We're completely cool. If you say, hey, here's my story, change my name, call me Gilbert or something like that, no problem. Send you can do that. bottom. Send your pork bottom. Send your pork bottom. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm like, send your pork bottom. What the no, hell are you talking about? No, not send your pork bottoms, <laughs> although we love bacon. But uh, I think that's pretty much everything for the show. So 
we're going to throw this one up there, and then you'll be hearing from us probably the middle of next week after we talk to Linda. Sweet. So this is Rojan. Peace out from someplace just south of Detroit. And this is Lobo to a better Connecticut. Peace out, everybody. Peace.
hurrah, hurrah. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh. Born in High Hachma. Hachma. We're talking Klingon. Oh my God. Oh, it's a first here. So this is. Oh my God, dude! It's the Muppets on crack. I'm just gonna go at that. I'm literally my I'm, my eyes are. I can like, hold the microphone and sit like three feet away from the desk. It's not as bad. Oh jeez. God, because I've been I've been up since four o'clock in the morning. A pregnant lady. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I can't do this. I'm sorry. I just can't. No, that's fine, man. I know. I understand what it's like to be tired. Trust me. Feels can see this bah. A pregnant lady in the UK suffers from bizarre eating disorder. She feels. How long are you going to torture yourself? Emma, who is who? Uh, Emma, who has been diagnosed with Pike. I can explain why. I it's a. I'm done. All right. <laughs> and we're doing the donkey. 